So here's the danger of coming to a sermon after <coughs> your pastor returns from vacation. It's like a travel log of where we've been and who we saw. The wedding was fabulous. My son Chris married an incredible woman named Katie. They're just made for each other. And approximately 40 people gathered last weekend on the Hawaiian island of Kauai, where they filmed Jurassic Park. Have, how many of you saw seen Jurassic Park? Wow. We are making slow progress on the cinematic scene. We're really getting there. Well, the Hawaiian church in which they were married uh, was founded in the 1800s and it served as the place where they exchanged vows. They get a thousand applications a year for weddings and only do two a month. The church sat in the shadows of a lush green mountain. The wedding coordinator coordinated. The bride and groom made people smile and cry and laugh celebrate. Flower girls flowered, proud parents sat in the pews. And everyone, every single person transformed their cell phones into cameras. And before you knew it, the event was a social media sensation. <laughs> social media began the day we left. We made our travels public, checking in and showing the route from RSW to Honolulu. And social media hit upon arriving in Oahu. That evening, Jane and I scurried to get a spectacular picture of a sunset. We gathered with other tourists, we watched the sunset, and as I pulled out the camera, a slow moving barge passed in front of the sun. Blocking a picture that never happened. <laughs> so dejected, we got some dinner and went to bed. But the next morning around 7 o'clock, my phone buzzed with a message from a friend whom I served with in Iraq. He said, here's my picture of a Hawaiian sunset. <laughs> so Dan Kalemba, my good friend, sent the message we met in 2008, 2009 while deployed in Iraq. I'm the guy on the left 30 pounds ago. <laughs> and that's Dan who looks, looks just as good as he did then. We've remained friends ever since. His wife, Kathy, saw the social media post of us going to Hawaii. She called Dan and boom, we get this picture at seven o'clock in the morning of my Hawaiian. <laughs> We reconnected, we had dinner, and we renewed a friendship that has never gone away. Dan proved a willingness to walk with us as we visited Hawaii in preparation for my son's wedding. You know, this large world in which we live is really quite small. We can view in real time tragedies and triumphs through large and expansive databases People can watch emerging <laughs> shows. We can watch television programs that we grew up on. How kind of amazing. Social media connects people around the world. Comments, likes, sadness, smiley faces. So Jesus, if he were with us today, ministering and walking along the shores of the Gulf of Mexico in Southwest Florida, People will be taking pictures, posting, look who I saw, look who taught. But Jesus would retweet Moses as he did in this passage. Are you familiar with Twitter and tweets? Okay. Twitter is a form of social media. It's limited to 288 characters. People offer advice, they offer commentary, they just complain. Most people just complain. Or they make fun of other people, policies and perspectives. And once a tweet is sent, a follower can like, can comment, or retweet the message. Jesus is retweeting Moses in this passage. He's quoting Deuteronomy out of chapter 8 in response to the temptations of Satan. These retweets of Moses serve as the grounding in which he sits and stands 
for his identity as God's son. Jesus is tempted, and after being tempted, retweets the words of Moses. So, temptations. Get the little play on words. <laughs> little joke, the temptations. Well, it's be a long morning, I can feel already. <laughs> temptations happen every day to us. Preacher Tom Long tells the following story of which some of us might identify. Experience that probably I have had, and I'm guessing that you have had. He tells this story, he writes, he goes, I, I was searching the aisles of the hardware store looking for super glue. I couldn't find it. So I went up to the customer service desk to ask for help from the young man standing at the cash register. He was on the telephone, and when he saw me coming in his direction, he turned his back towards me. I could tell he was making a personal phone call, but I just waited. The call went on and on. Oh, so you saw the movie? Really? Oh, you're kidding. What did Susan say? <clears throat> Finally, I cleared my throat, said as long. He'd give a sharp glance in my direction and kept on talking. That's Susan's fresh. Oh, I know. I hate that. So you're going to the game Friday? Long says I was now beginning to get very impatient. Pardon me, I said. I need to ask one question. He let out a sigh and mumbled in the front. Catch you later, Charlie. I got to go. He looked at me with exasperated and said, well, what do you want? Spit it out. I'm looking for super glue, said Wong. It's on the third aisle, in plain view, he said with this thing. And as I walked down the aisle, the farther I went, the angrier I got. How dare this young kid treat me, a customer, so rudely. I was tempted to go back and give him a piece of my mind. How many of us have had that experience? You know, we all play in our minds the things we want to say. We had that chance one more time. Get in the car, we drive down 41, and we mumble ourselves, next time. <laughs> There's one thing we all know about is temptation. It's a theological concept that doesn't need any unpacking. You don't need an eight-week course on temptation. We know what it is. Each of us could lead a course on temptation without any preparation. Temptation is a spiritual COVID that has hung around for centuries. Years ago, Flip Wilson made a series of laughs with the phrase, the devil made me do it. He would dress up as Geraldine. The devil made me do it. We always seem to need a scapegoat for our guilt, don't we? It's not my fault. The devil made me do it. It's not my fault. He made me do it. It's not my fault. She made me do it. I can't believe they made me do it. As if we're powerless. Temptation is always there. We're tempted to break our diets, to flirt with somebody at work, to cheat on our taxes, to gossip about a friend, to lie our way out of trouble, you name it, we are tempted. We know about temptation. And when people see others succumbing to temptation, the phones come out, the pictures are snapped, and they're posted, can you believe what I saw today? As my mom always told me, always behave no matter where you are because you never know whom you might meet. And we met Dan Kalenda in Hawaii. Temptations, we dwell on the little and the big things in life. Tempted not to return the lost and, to the lost and found a wallet filled with cash or maybe a wallet with no more cash in it. We're tempted to sneak a smoke, have a flame, one more drink, one more juicy rumor. One more cup of coffee, Sherry. Just one more cup of coffee. Those temptations, well, they'll always be there. 
These are temptations of misbehaving, doing something that breaks the rules or puts our health or lives in jeopardy. But the temptations that Jesus faced, they're not about misbehaving. The temptations put forth by the tempter, they're not to violate the Ten Commandments, they're not to break the law of Moses. These three temptations collectively ask Jesus to compromise something greater in his life. The devil is tempting Jesus not to, not to steal an item from Walmart or sneak a peek at a Playboy centerfold or pick a fight with the neighbor. It's something much more drastic. It's asking Jesus to become somebody that he's not. Jesus is being tempted to deny who he is, to ignore his baptism, and to forget that he is a child of God. You know, we've reduced baptisms to cute little... I love baptisms. Don't get me wrong. I love baptisms. I love holding a child in my arm. I love anointing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and giving them the water and welcoming them into the family of God. They become cute little dynamic events. They're dressed in white. There's these cries of fear. The water dribbles down. And this nice, peaceful, smiling baby goes, Ah, I can't lie! It goes on like that. <laughs> and the congregation smiles. We laugh. Pastor rocks the baby back and forth. Parents stand proudly. And we forget the words at Jesus' baptism. You are my beloved. You belong to my kingdom. With you, I am well pleased. This child or adult is claimed as a child of God, an heir to the kingdom who becomes part of God's mission. The tempter is asking Jesus to abandon that mission. If you've ever watched the movie The Blues Brothers with Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi, they are on a mission from God. And they're tempted to detract from that mission, tempted to compromise who they are, tempted to abandon the mission to which they are called. Here's a clip. called to be on a mission for God or just something nice and sweet and fun to do or something that makes a complete difference in the lives of people in our community and around the world. Jesus is tempted to abandon the mission that he's called to abandon his identity, to let go of a mission of going down the long and hard road to Jerusalem. It's when we come face to face with our identity that we are tempted not to be who we are. I've read article after article about clergy who have thought about leaving the ministry. Why do they think about that? What caused them to ponder leaving the pulpit and going out to another kind of public kind of life? 
Most articles point out that they tire the challenges, they're worn down by the demands, they're unable to prioritize their work. They're tempted to forego their identity as someone set aside to be a minister. 20 years ago, NPR did an interview with a, a person who went, uh, who became a pastor. The person owned an insurance company, went bankrupt. And they said, well, why'd you go into the ministry? I wanted to work somewhere at a church where people would always love me and care for me. I don't think that ever happens. People are caring, people are loving, but sometimes when you're walking along the pathway to Jerusalem and to new life, there are challenges, and it challenges your identity. I think they went into ministry because their insurance company failed. That's what I think what happened. We look at our identity of who we are as children of God, baptized, believers, Christians, part of a worshiping congregation. It's a matter of knowing who we are and knowing that because of who we are, we're going to face challenges as Jesus did. There are three temptations to, to turn stones into bread, to throw himself down from the top of the temple and to worship the tempter. These are not temptations to do bad things. They are temptations to be someone else to live a life other than whom God has called him to be. And our role is simply not, not simply to be people who read the story like we do every Lenten season, every Easter season, on our walk to, with Jesus to Jerusalem. Our role is to solidify our identity as baptized members of Christ's church. That's what Lent is all about, to deepen our relationship with Christ so that our identity is solidified. Because we are called, we are tempted. Because we are Christians, we are tempted. Because we make a profession of faith, we are tempted. Because we are baptized, we are tempted. Because we are Christians, we are tempted. In several conversations with people, we've discussed the meaning and importance of church membership. Is it necessary? <laughs> eh, probably not. People can come and go as they please. People can make the argument that the fewer members a church has, the less per capita they have to pay. Woo, there's a financial benefit. <laughs> Yet membership is akin to that of baptism, to make a commitment to the mission of the church, to embrace an identity rooted in our baptism as one of God's children. To yield to temptation is to say, I'm not a child of God, and I will not take my part in God's drama of redemption seriously. So to retweet Jesus' answers, we don't live by bread alone. We live by the every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Those are guardrails that Jesus throws up. Those are tweets, retweets of Moses he throws up that shows I am rooted in something much deeper than the passing of a fling, of a passing of an idea, the passing of a motto. There's something rooted in scripture that means a great deal to him and should to us. So we walk with scripture every day through our lives. The verses serve as a, a guardrail. They serve as something we can hold on to that, that's a truth that gets us through the difficult moments of life. They serve as guardrails for our identity and our mission. Knowing who we are and where we are going is the tweet and Facebook post of a lifetime that we want all the world to see. So let me close with an advertisement. The Lenten book study is entitled The Walk by Adam Hamilton. The study will ask participants to examine their walk with Jesus. We all have different walks. The book focuses on five spiritual disciplines. The first meeting is Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock on March 8th in the church office. The study will last 50 minutes. I hope it's a tempting offer. Whoa. <laughs> Am I losing you yet? We want to connect with our Lord. We want to have a spiritual life that can be retweeted. Next Sunday, the sermon topic will be if Jesus used social media posts to share based on John 3, 1 to 17. The retweets of God's word in our lives affirms our identity, affirms our calling. And that's a social media post. I want to put out there. Amen.